Science and technology have never been kind to religion. They've shown us that lightning is caused by an electrical buildup in clouds, not the wrath of gods, and that disease is caused by pathogens, not evil spirits. They've shown us that the Earth is not the center of the universe or even our solar system. They've shown us that the universe, Earth, life, and even humanity itself are far older than 6,000 years old. They've even shown us it's possible to create simple life forms in a lab from off-the-shelf chemicals. These challenges to religion won't end with what we know today. Certainly we'll continue to find additional fossil evidence sorted by evolutionary lineage, and we'll continue to not find a single human fossil in the Jurassic. But we are currently in the process of developing new technologies that will radically alter society and bring new challenges for everyone, most especially the religious. To understand what's coming, it helps to understand a little backstory. In 1965, Intel co-founder Gordon Moore noticed that the number of transistors that could fit on an integrated circuit was doubling every two years. This Moore's law is why computing power continually increases while prices drop. In 2001, inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil published an observation that Moore's law can be extended over a hundred years into the past with surprising accuracy from integrated circuits, to transistors, to vacuum tubes, to relays, to mechanical calculating devices. Furthermore, Kurzweil noticed that the rate of change itself is increasing, such that today the doubling occurs every year instead of every two years. And he noticed the same pattern occurs with many non-computer technologies, such as bioengineering and robotics. He called this rate of technological change the law of accelerating returns. Our minds are designed to think linearly, and we don't perceive exponential change very well. So let me put the concept into perspective. When the Human Genome Project began in 1990, it was expected to take 15 years to complete. Skeptics doubted the project was possible, and they appeared vindicated when, after half the 15 years had passed, only 1% of the genome had been completed but they hadn't taken into account the exponential growth of technology and didn't realize that the project was actually right on schedule. And in fact, it was even completed a couple years ahead of schedule. Projecting the law of accelerating returns into the future results in even more profound change. If it holds true, the first 25 years of this century should result in 100 years of progress at the rate we experienced in 2001. At that same rate, we should experience 20,000 years of progress during the 21st century alone. Think about that for a moment. 20,000 years of progress in just 100 years. So what will such rapid progress mean for us? Well, by the year 2020, we should be able to purchase computers with the equivalent computing power of the human brain for about $1,000. By 2030, the same price should purchase the computing power of a thousand human brains. Also by then, we should have successfully created artificial intelligence from scratch or through reverse engineering the human brain, allowing us to run human equivalent intelligence as software. We'll then download that intelligence to robotic bodies. And that leads me to my first future challenge for religion, sex bots. Yes, I mean sex with robots and a lot more than just that. Although today's robots and sex dolls are still far from human realistic, already we're seeing robots being merged with sex dolls to give them limited sexual behavior. Over time, they will become increasingly realistic in both appearance and action. By the mid-2020s, with the integration of sophisticated artificial intelligence, robots will be able to do anything a human companion can do, and in fact will be virtually indistinguishable from humans. And that will almost certainly lead to a crisis among human relationships. Imagine custom designing a companion who looks and behaves exactly how you like in every way, mentally, physically, emotionally, and who can tirelessly do chores and even work for you. We will fall in love with our robots, even more deeply than we do with humans, because unlike humans, they will provide everything we crave in another person, except perhaps reproduction but even that will likely come along eventually. If you think gay marriage is controversial, that's nothing compared to the possibly hundreds of millions of people who will want to marry their sex bots. 
That will force religions that exert rigid control over sex and marriage to change, or they will hemorrhage followers. The manufacturing technology that will likely make such advanced robotics and artificial intelligence possible is called molecular nanotechnology. First postulated in 1959 by Richard Feynman and elaborated upon by K. Eric Drexler in the 1980s, molecular nanotechnology is the manufacturing of complex structures at the molecular level. Sufficiently developed, it would allow the use of self-replicating nanoscale robots, or nanobots, to cheaply manufacture almost any product with perfect precision out of little more than dirt, water, and air, using simple carbon to create materials as strong as steel but with only one fiftieth the weight. First dismissed as science fiction, nanotechnology has now gone mainstream. The world currently spends well over 13 billion dollars and publishes tens of thousands of scientific papers on nanotech research every year. While currently still primitive, advanced nanotech manufacturing is expected to arrive within 10 to 20 years, well within most of our lifetimes. So what will advanced molecular nanotechnology mean for us? Well, apart from fundamentally altering our relationships as I mentioned, it could nearly eliminate pollution and rapidly restore the environment to pre-industrial conditions. And the development of desktop nanofactories should do for material science what computers have done for information technology, allowing us to create essentially anything we want. Clothing, furniture, appliances, computers, robots, vehicles, solar panels, even food, making each of us entirely self-sufficient. In other words, wealthy beyond the imagination of previous generations. That should be a major challenge for Christians, since Jesus repeatedly warned how it's extremely difficult for rich people to achieve salvation. But I suspect they'll continue to do what they do now, just ignore it. Something harder to ignore will be another likely benefit of advanced nanotechnology, immortality. Nanobots released into our bloodstreams will not only be able to clean our arteries and repair organs damaged by age or trauma, but eventually they could even restore our DNA to how it was when we were in our 20s, turning fragile senior citizens into healthy young men and women overnight. Religious institutions can handle medical technology deferring death a few years, but put it off indefinitely? What allure is an eternal paradise in heaven when life on earth offers essentially the same thing, only without all the divine strings attached? How many religions could thrive or even survive in that environment? They could still warn us that one can still die from accident or violence, so we'd better get right with God, except that sufficiently advanced nanotech will likely allow us to make backups of ourselves. How would that work? Well, if nanobots were to disassemble an object molecule by molecule and record each molecule's precise composition and position, the information could then be used to assemble an exact duplicate of that object. So if we had this process performed each night as we slept, we could store backups of ourselves as computer files. And that brings up another challenge for religion. If we die and are reassembled from a backup copy, what happens to the soul? Does it transfer to the new body? What if there are multiple copies? Does the soul split itself evenly between them? Or does each copy get a full soul? Or do copies lack souls entirely? If so, how will we know? And if nobody notices whether or not they have a soul, doesn't that render the whole concept of an afterlife irrelevant? What hold will religions have over humanity then? It doesn't end there. This same control over matter will almost surely lead to the ability to upgrade our bodies, making them stronger, faster, tougher, with much better senses and even entirely new abilities. What happens to the image of God as the perfect designer when we can do a far better job than he supposedly did? And if we can upgrade the body, we'll surely be able to upgrade the brain, increasing our intelligence. Smarter people are less likely to be religious. How will religions handle whole congregations that are now bright enough to ask critical questions and actually think about what their scriptures say? Here's something else to think about. If a brain can be recorded to a computer, it can likely be run on that computer. 
and perhaps live in a computer-generated virtual world along with artificial intelligences. Today's virtual worlds, found most commonly in computer games, have come a long way over the past few decades. But they're still viewed on flat screens and are not yet photorealistic. However, that will change dramatically over the next 10 years. Experienced with advanced virtual reality equipment, or without the need of such equipment in the case of software brains, these virtual worlds will likely appear to all our senses as realistic as the real world. Just as with today's games, future virtual worlds will enhance their realism and interactivity with populations of artificially intelligent virtual characters who are unaware they exist only in software. To these virtual characters, the programmers who create their universes will be their gods. So will the troubleshooting personnel who have almost unlimited power when they visit the virtual worlds, just like game masters in today's online games. Now, if virtual worlds become as realistic as the real world, and they're populated by artificial intelligences that are unaware they're in a virtual world, how do we know we aren't virtual characters living in a virtual world right now? We can't know. And considering that there could eventually be hundreds, thousands, millions or more virtual worlds in the real world, the odds that we actually reside in the real world instead of a virtual one could be extremely remote. This does make one thing clear as far as religion is concerned. If indeed there is a creator of our universe, and even if he is capable of great power within the confines of our universe, that does not mean he is necessarily any more intelligent or powerful than any of today's computer game designers. This proves that the theistic claim that God must be personal, uncaused, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, enormously powerful, and enormously intelligent, completely false. Even if one were to argue that our virtual world designer must have a God who created him, Many current virtual worlds possess theologies and even physics that vary considerably from our world, so there would be no way to know the theology of the real God. The only functional theology as far as a virtual world is concerned would be one the programmer arbitrarily created for it himself. Finally, what would we think of a programmer who not only required the artificially intelligent occupants of his virtual worlds to worship him, but also hid any real evidence of his existence from them, and then, after their virtual deaths, made them suffer eternal pain for not believing in him. Would we think him justified for creating such a world? Or would we consider him somewhere between a pathetic loser and a sick bastard? Think about that the next time you read the Bible. Will all this really happen within a couple decades? Well, unless we run up against unexpected technological roadblocks or a worldwide disaster occurs, it's hard to see how something similar to such a future won't happen. Even if we tried to stop it, it would require a concerted global effort across many scientific disciplines, which would never happen because the potential benefits of these technologies are just too great. But there's a great way for us to find out for certain. Just wait about 20 years and we'll all know one way or another. The next couple decades won't see the end of religious belief, but the technologies I've described will surely destroy some religions and severely weaken or alter the rest. And there's one more piece of good news. We should finally get our jetpacks and flying cars.